Welcome to the Draw Shops Get Genius Podcast, where we talk to today's business influencers to pick their brain and pull out their genius. It's time to get genius. Well, hello, hello, listeners. We are back with another fantastic interview. I super love this interview today. Uh, There's so many great Great takeaways for startup entrepreneurs, even those that are 20 years into their business. Um, that's my goal, is for you to always have some some really great takeaways and even sometimes just reminders. And today, our interviewee is Tom King, and he is the founder of Staviva Brands, which um, is a company with a mission to help food manufacturers replace unhealthy sugars in their products with natural options. And I will tell you that when uh, Tom agreed to be on our podcast, he he sent to me a package of just an incredible amount of ag- different flavored agaves and sweeteners and all kinds of things that you can bake with, um, make all kinds of recipes with, and it tastes amazing, yet you're not getting the carbs and the sugar effect. And it, for those of you interested in living a ketogenic lifestyle, uh, it completely a thousand percent supports that. So it's really cool. But we do talk about that. A lot of what we're going to talk about though is, you know, what are those common mistakes that we as entrepreneurs make in our businesses? Um, what are, how do we evaluate risks that we should or should not take? And there's a lot of talk on, on mindset and just really getting in touch with the reason why you have the business or service that you do. And um, Tom just has some really great aha moments that he's had and shares those with us that I really feel a lot of us will relate to. Um, he's, he calls himself a part-time personal development wonk and a part biohacker info geek. So I'm all about the, the biohacking and it totally fascinates me. So I love having guests like Tom who, who can geek out on that with me. Um, he's, he's really into the real definition of success, which we're going to talk about on the show. And, um, it's really not all about how much money you make. Um, that might be a part of it, but there's so many other things that we should be measuring. Um, Tom's just pretty, pretty awesome. He's, he's got some really cool stories and I'm excited for you guys to hear just how he's grown this business from just, you know, learning about what this product was and then his mind just kind of snowballing and thinking about what this product could potentially be. And man, has he gotten there and you'll get to hear all of that. So I hope you enjoyed this interview and have a wonderful day. Hey, Tom, and welcome to our podcast. Thanks, Summer. I really appreciate you hosting me on your most excellent podcast. And I've been looking forward to this all week. So yeah, let's do this. I have definitely been looking forward to this. Um, you, you call yourself a biohacker info geek, which is I completely relate to, as our listeners know. So I'm especially excited to connect with you and about all that kind of stuff, especially as it's related to being an entrepreneur and starting and running a business. So I'm, I'm very excited about that as, as I'm sure, um, you live by being at our absolute best physically and mentally, will that make us that much better in entrepreneur? So I'm excited to talk about all of that good stuff. Terrific. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you call yourself as a self-confessed serial entrepreneur, and I'd love to hear your definition of that and kind of your how you became that. What was your journey into becoming an entrepreneur? Um, well, I think that it's probably in my blood. So I'm a fifth generation entrepreneur. So my dad had a uh, construction company and then moved from having a construction company into cattle ranching. My grandfather had a tent and awning company. Um, He made the field covers for the NFL teams, and he supplied 
tents to the um, to the U.S. Army during World War II. My great grandfather um, also had an awning company, and he supplied the tents to the U.S. Army during World War One. And I had two uh, great great grandfather. Um, who I think was in the textiles industry. And then before that, um, I think that I just had a, a, a thief. He was sort of a, I guess, a marauder <laughs> way yeah. back in the 1700s. So I would classify that as an entrepreneur. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's in my DNA. And, you know, and I've had corporate jobs before. Um, you know, I, I, when I was in, in college, I basically didn't have money for tuition, um, which uh, resulted in me having to start my own business because I think I was basically unemployable. Um, I didn't, hadn't really developed my work, work ethic yet. Um, but I do remember being at my parents' house when a process server um, paid my my mother a visit to serve a garnishment on one of my dad's employees. And I was just completely fascinated with how he did that. I, I rushed out to his car and I, I asked him, I'm like, what well, are you a sheriff? Or are you licensed by the law? And he said, no, um, you know, just a process server. And, um, and I, you know, so I said, Hey, do you mind if I ride along? And which he thought was pretty weird. It probably was at the time, but I did. I rode along with him and watched him, you know, serving legal papers. And I asked if I could work for him, uh, you know, for the entire summer so I could, you know, have enough money to live on and get my tuition. And so he said, sure. Um, you know, and so I ended up, he ended up sitting around doing nothing and I ended up serving legal papers on people, which was really a mixed bag of, uh, uh, of, uh, having people yell at me and, you know, a woman once pulled my hair and oh, getting wow. pushed around. So that was the law lo- that, and then at the end of the summer, um, he had already spent all the money, um, and he didn't have any way to pay me. Um, which of course I went back home and I was just completely distraught. Am I going to have to drop out of school? And my mom, she, you know, she always championed my, sort of entrepreneurial side. And she said, well, you know, all the clients and why don't you just, why don't you just start your own business? And I said, I, I don't know anything about that. And she said, your dad did it. Your grandfather did it. Why can't you, um, you know, and she said, the sky's the limit for you. And so that was the name of my first business was STL services that stood for sky's the limit. Oh. My mom really pushed me to do it. And I went to, you know, every, every lawyer in town and said, I'll serve your legal papers for you. Um, and, you know, and that was my, that grew into my first business and was able to buy a house and, um, you know, and paid my tuition and actually ended up making, you know, a lot more money than, than anybody that I knew at the time. So, um, that was my first business and I, have my my mom to completely thank for um you know giving me the the positive uh reinforcement that i could do it what an awesome experience and and from that what was what were some of the biggest lessons that you learned um the biggest lesson that i learned is um is not to give up you know there was there was times because serving legal papers on people is not is not a lot of fun. I mean, you're catching people, you know, at their worst time. And, you know, and there was a lot of times that I just wanted to quit doing it. But, you know, my philosophy was, you know, if I could do it with a gentle touch and a good attitude, um, you know, and, you know, and maybe make the experience a little less, you know, impactful to them. And, um, you know, just, I think that coming from a place of contribution, you know, how can I make this situation for these people better and just never quitting always, you know, always, you know, grinding, um, and hustling. Right. So then when did the, the cereal part come into play? Well, um, so I sold my, uh, I sold my process serving business to a private investigator and subsequently moved to Arizona Um, and I had never really had a real job. 
And I lived in Arizona uh, for quite some time and decided that I wanted to get into the uh, into the radio industry. And um, yeah, so I took a job actually, and I had spent probably a good 12 years actually working for other people and ended up working as a regional vice president for a Fortune 100 company. And after 9-11, um, this company that I worked for, we produced a lot of concerts and live events. Um, and after 9-11, that business sort of started to fall apart. And then that's when I hit the crossroads of, well, what, do I, what am I going to do now? Do I want to work for another Fortune 100 company or should I start my own business? And that's when I started a company called Multimediary. And we tied in... Um, we tied in the ex the entertainment experience with uh, consumer products, and so it was a cross marketing event uh, event company oh, cool. um, that I had. So I had the privilege to work with just an unbelievable amount of uh, you know music celebrities. Um, I parlayed that into um, launching four different record labels. Um, and a movie production company, which we produced a, a television show that was on UPN, and I made a couple feature movies, and um, yeah, and then decided it was time for me to uh, to move on from there. And uh, I always had my my business now as a side hustle, which my business is called the Staviva Brands and Staviva Ingredients, um, but the FDA didn't didn't allow it. Uh, as a sweetener. So once I saw that there could be some potential there, I sold off the record labels and the movie, movie, the movie production company um, and decided to dive headfirst into, into the sweetener business. And, and uh, it's been a, almost a 15, 16 year journey for me. Um, and, uh, you know, now the company is a multi-million dollar company and we, are an ingredient supplier to probably a lot of the you know a lot of the products that um, that are naturally sweetened that you might have in your uh, your pantry now. Right. So, and I want to talk, and I think this next question will lead into that. Um, you know, a lot of people their their typical measurement of success as an entrepreneur um, or business owner is how much money they've made. <laughs> What, but you know, I just, I would love to hear your opinion on that. Is that the truth? Is that part of it? I mean, what, how do you measure success as in, in business and as an entrepreneur? Um, I, my mind has kind of shifted away from money. I think that, you know, when I was a younger entrepreneur, it was all about the Benjamins and I, you know, as I think as I mature, as I've matured as an entrepreneur, it becomes much, much less about about money and more about contribution and legacy. Um, I, I mean, the philosophy behind Staviva Staviva Brands is you know doing well while doing good, and so I think. Um, being happy. Like, I mean, every day that I get up, I tell myself I get to go to work instead of I have to go to work. So I think that it's, it, I have such a level of joy and enjoyment in what I do. And I think that when you come from a space of contribution and gratitude, um, you know, and you apply that to your business, um, it really gives you a sense of aliveness. And I would say that, that, the the issue of being a wealthy entrepreneur and are you ever going to get rich being an entrepreneur is i think you will if you if you make getting rich not your goal and you make your goal uh one of contribution uh and always feeling super alive about what you're doing exactly so when is that the the place or the mindset that you were in when you started Staviva? Well, I wouldn't say that it was. I, I would say, I mean, is, I mean, I'm continually evolving as a human being. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I would say when I first started Staviva, I mean, I was introduced to the Stevia leaf in, you know, in 1980. 
eight when I ran into a gentleman who had come back from Paraguay and had a bunch of different herbs that he had procured from the Guarani Indians. And he had a, he had a container that had, you know, that had like a, a paste, a paste type substance. And, you know, he said, he said, you should try this. And I tried it and it was very, very sweet. And sort of a light bulb went off in my head, like, wow, so this doesn't have any calories or carbohydrates. And yet it's really sweet. I wonder how hard it would be to extract the sweet constituents from this. So, I mean, that was sort of what, you know, set the fire, um, you know, of it, it was, it was about the opportunity, like, wow, this could be, you know, a billion dollar idea. Yeah. And that's where it started, but it really, it took a major shift because as I matured and, you know, as I, you know, really, you know, looked in the mirror to discover my why, like, why would I do this? And, um, that's when the, the big component of my why is to make an impact on metabolic disease. So that's really the driver instead of, hey, this is a million dollar um, idea in the beginning, maybe. Yeah. yeah. But as I've as I've grown and matured as a, you know, as a as a human being and an entrepreneur, uh, it's really more about, you know, how how will this impact the world in a positive way? Right. So when did your passion for health and and how food obviously plays such a big role in that. When did that, when did that get birthed, I guess? Um, I think that it was a personal quest because I've, I have always, so I've always kind of struggled with my weight. Like there's been times when I've been thin, there's times when I've been fat. And so it's always been this yo-yo, this up and down weight thing. And I could never really figure out, you know, the reasons behind it. Like, you know, why is this happening? And, you know, that's when I started diving into nutrition. And that's when I started really developing a a good understanding of, uh, you know, of how sugar plays a role in, you know, in insulin, you know, production and how insulin production can play a role in, you know, in storing, you know, storing belly fat and how belly fat can contribute to metabolic disease. And it creates this, this sort of circular issue. And um, so it was really more of a solution for myself. And these sweeteners sort of played a role in it because I knew that that sugar was tricking, trick, triggering a, a metabolic response in me. And I, I knew that there was some sort of a solution. So selfishly, the products that I've created, I mean, all of them I test on myself and, you know, test my blood sugar before and after to make sure that they, they don't affect me. But it was really about, you know, how do I, you know, how do I maintain a healthy balance in my life and how do I cut sugar out, um, you know, and how do I teach other people to do it? And what was the difference for you in terms of performance when you made those changes? Well, I mean, I have to be perfectly honest. I, even though, you know, I started this company, you know, um, in the, the late nineties and, um, you know, I still battled with, you know, my weight going up and down, even though I had by and large cut sugar out. Um, but I think I was pretty undisciplined and I knew about a key, I knew about ketogenic diet. I knew about, you know, ketosis, but I didn't really apply it to my life. And then about a year and a half ago, I just basically hit a wall because I had, I was 35 pounds overweight. My blood pressure was, you know, was pretty high. And I mean, I really had to look at myself in the mirror and, you know, and, and confront myself, you know, with being a fraud and being a liar, because it's like, I'm running, I, I run a company that has products that, you know, that cater to a ketogenic lifestyle but I'm not leading by example, you know, I'm not walking my talk and it, it was really a painful experience, but it also was a springboard for me to, you know, make a a shift in my mindset and really capitalize on it and make, and take a stance and say, not another day. Will I, you know, will I live a lie? And that's, I mean, then I fully adopted, you know, a ketogenic lifestyle and, you know, and that's, I mean, that's what I do today. I've dropped 35 pounds. My blood pressure is 120 over 80. 
Um, you know, wow. I'm a freak about data collection. So every day, you know, I take my blood ketone levels and blood sugar levels and check my weight. It's and that pulse. biohacker in you. <laughs> it does because I'm fascinated by it. Because it is, the thing yeah. is, is like you make these little shifts in your diet and you can, you, you see, you can see like almost immediate, you know, change, you know, you can see changes physiologically, but then, you know, I was going online and taking, taking online tests to test, you know, short and long-term memory and cognition. And I mean, I could see it as I removed carbs and sugars from my, from my diet and I increased the amount of healthy fats um, you know, and lean proteins that I was taking in, I could see an actual increase, you know, in my cognitive ability and my memory, like a 30% increase. And I was like, man, I'm really onto something here. And when you can measure it like that, it just, it keeps you in it and engaged with it all the time because you're seeing the results. But absolutely. And I mean, one of the things that I adopted years ago is journaling every day. So, I mean, every single day, first thing I do in the morning, I have a bulletproof copy. I bust out my journal and I start writing things down. And that I used for data collection. And what I found is I can go back in my journals like four years, five years, 10 years, or even going back six months, you know, and, I, and this is how you track your progress. So I'm a big believer in, you know, you're not going to know where you're going unless you know where you've been. Yes. And that's, I'm huge on, on journaling and, and even, you know, on, on an entrepreneurial quest journaling. I mean, that's huge because you can see where you started at point A and you might not see the growth, you know, in, when you get to point B, but if you go back in history and you read your, your journals, you can be like, holy cow, I really, you know, this is really working. Right. Well, I think that the whole story is really powerful. And what's so ironic about it is the changes that you made well into your business. And meanwhile, the business is something that fully supports a ketogenic lifestyle. So it's, it's so cool. I think as entrepreneurs, a lot of us get, we're very passionate about when we start something and we get really excited about it. And then there's, we have a tendency to get so lost in it that sometimes you might even forget what you're sitting on. You know, this, you've got this incredible product or service that you're offering to others. And then sometimes it's like, well, wait a minute, I should really look into the value of this even more myself. And it's kind of like a, like you said, you're, you're just constantly evolving and it's, it's almost like a, I'm, I, I would imagine that having that shift that you had where you kind of looked at yourself and said, okay, wait a minute, I want to, I want to be totally true to what I'm selling increased your and elevated your business. Yeah, I think it definitely elevated elevated the business. I think that also, you know, when you have employees working for you, if you're not walking your talk, it can affect your, you know, your ability to lead. So, I mean, that's a, that's a huge plus, but I think as an entrepreneur, I, you know, your business is your life. And I think that, you know, if you're not being self-reflective in your life, um, and being self-reflective in your business and continually asking your, yourself, you know, what's your reason why, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that can, what happens is you can, you know, you start to get stagnant and then you're not growing and a business that's not growing is failing. Right. Exactly. So, so that, you know, we could call, you know, a common mistake that entrepreneurs may make. Uh, within their business, whether they're starting or they've, you know, they're just so lost in it. Um, what are some other common mistakes that you see entrepreneurs make when starting and running their businesses? Um, I get a lot. I mean, we have a successful food business and, you know, so in, in Portland, Oregon is a, is a foodie town. So I do get a lot of, um, you know, I get a lot of startups coming to me looking for advice or looking for, you know, looking for an investment. And I would say, you know, when you look at people that are investing in entrepreneurs, um, one of one of the, you know, one of the things they're looking at is does this, you know, does this, 
do they have an exit strategy? Um, I think that's not as important, you know, like the exit strategy is not as important of a factor to me as understanding scalability. Mm -hmm. So are you able to scale? Like, you know, you, you, you can service a thousand stores now, but how do you, how do you service a thousand stores? So, you know, being able to have an eye on scalability, I think is critical. No, I think that's such a great point. Um, I, you hear that a lot in conversations. What's your exit strategy? What's your exit strategy? And sometimes it's like, is that really what I need to be focusing on? You know, and it's, it seems like such an old school question to ask. It's totally old school. Totally <laughs> so, old school. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up because I think a lot of people today feel so stressed about it and it adds this undue pressure where it's like, that's not really where the focus should be. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the, you know, because not every person is going to be looking at exiting out of their business. I think that, you know, venture capitalists and equity people want they, the exit strategy is how they're going to make the most amount of money on their, on their investment. But I'm not sure that that really benefits the entrepreneur because, you know, if you're constantly looking at your, you know, at your exit strategy and not looking at your ability to scale, um, the, that you're not going to have anything to exit out with. Exactly. So true. Who are some of the, cause I, I know, you know, having, having the success that you have had, um, people come to you for advice. Who have you gone to? Who have been some of your role models that, that you've taken from and learned from? Well, I would say that my father was was really a great role model for me as far as business. Um, you know, I went to him a lot for advice. Um, I think now the people you know that that I go to for advice are mostly um, mostly people that are influencers, um, you know, like social media influencers, because I think that social media has become you know, so important that, I mean, we have an initiative here that, you know, we want to become a social media company that just happens to sell sweeteners. That's how important social media is to us. So, um, so some of the people that I think that have absolutely mastered uh, social media and people that I follow and, you know, that are mentors for me, they probably don't know who I am, but <laughs> I know who they are. It's probably uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. I mean, Gary V is, I listen to him on a daily basis. And yeah. he is, I mean, he, he really, uh, I mean, he emulates everything that, that you know, I would like to be. Um, Tom Bilyeu, a friend of mine who's one of the founders of Quest Nutrition, um, brilliant genius. Tim Ferriss, Lewis Howes. Um, yeah, I would say that that's my own personal justice league. And how how important do you think it is for other entrepreneurs to have those role models? Well, I think it's critical. Um, I think that if you know, I mean, it's said that you were you were the sum of the five people that are closest to you. Um, I think that you know you need to take a good look around um, the people you know people that you're, you know, you're associating with. Um, if you, you know, if you don't see a future with them, um, I think it's a good idea that you sort of reevaluate those types of relationships. I think you're only as good as the people you surround yourself with. Um, I think that if you, you know, if you level up your game um, and you have the opportunity to surround yourself with people that are far better, you know, than you, then the only thing that you'll have to do is actually grow. And I think that it's absolutely critical that you, you surround yourself by the very best. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Hmm. So I want to talk about risk hmm. and how you view risk. Is it an individual thing? How important is it to business? And then, of course, you know, if you can share with us some some stories of risks that you have taken and, and what the payoff was. But um, I think it's a scary thing, obviously. Um, but I would just love to hear 
your take on it and, you know, is it important to, to every person to take or is it not for everyone? This is such an excellent question. And actually, this is the first time I've been asked ask this question. Oh, good. <laughs> and, and this is really great because it does, I mean, you know, every every person that we hire, we we put them through a six human needs analysis. So there's basically six human needs, you know, and there's a need for certainty. And that means that everything needs to be, you know, stable and certain for you. And then there's a need for uncertainty. Um, you know, an uncertainty means that things constantly change. So in, you know, in my needs analysis, I'm very high in uncertainty, which means that I thrive in risk, um, you know, because risk provides a certain level of change and a certain, um, certain level of, of, uh, of excitement. But I think that risk is super important, but I think mitigated risk is far more important. And that is understanding risk and return. Mm -hmm. Like if you, you know, I certainly take a lot of risks myself, but I always calculate what the return is and what the potential, you know, what the potential downside could be. And I never put things at risk that would affect our working capital or affect my employees because I have a bigger responsibility there. Yeah, absolutely. What's, what's the process that you go through in determining the risks that you will take? Well, I usually write it down. So, I mean, everything, every decision that I have to make that involves risk, um, you know, I'll write down, you know, what it is that, you know, that we're going to do, like if we're going to buy a piece of equipment and if this piece of equipment is, you know, is going to be $200,000, is this what kind of a return can we expect? Will it increase the level of productivity? Will it increase you know the quality of our product? So all of those get factored in, so I can develop a return. You know what type of a return on an investment? You know could we possibly see? I also look at the tax benefits of making that investment. Like will we be able to? You know will we be able to? Um, you know, write off certain portion of it, um, you know, depreciation. So I look at that factor as well to get, you know, to get a bottom line on, okay, so this is really what's at risk. This is what our return is. Can we afford the $200,000 coming in out of our working capital? And then I put in a lot of what ifs like, okay, so what if we have a client cancel on us? So the what if scenarios are like, you know, those are the what ifs are like, what's the worst possible thing that could happen? And would this, you know, would this put, would this put the company, you know, in a point of risk that we wouldn't be able to return from? And so, you know, I sort of assess a number between one and 10. And if the risk factor is generally below five and the return factor is a below is above eight, then, you know, it seems like a good idea. And we usually pull the trigger on it. I like that. I like that a lot. What's, what are, you know, one or two of the biggest risks that you have taken? And maybe it's personal, maybe it's business related. I would say that the, the biggest risks that I, that I've taken, um, business wise would would be probably in purchasing real estate. So, I mean, a lot of, a lot of businesses will, you know, will just lease. Um, it require our business requires that we do a certain amount of build out, you know, so we can have a, uh, a sanitary production room. Right. And so I started investing in real estate. So instead of leasing the buildings that we were, um, you know, that we were going to be occupying, I started buying the buildings and, uh, it, there, there was a lot of debt, you know, like the latest building that we bought, it's a $4 million building, you know, that I'm buying personally under an LLC and that, and we're putting another million dollars into it. So that is, that's a lot of risk oh, yeah. and, um, it doesn't really keep me up at night. Um, but it definitely does make my heart race sometimes when I think about it. 
And sometimes when you commit to something like that, and sometimes that's working with a mentor or a coach, or when you invest into it, it it actually gets you on your game even more because you, you have that investment in there. (laughs) So it's like you're extra driven to make sure that you're meeting your, you know, payments and, and whatever it is that you need to do to keep, to make it a success and to make the return good. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you, you know, before I went into this situation with the building, I was also, you know, I was also looking at ways to sort of mitigate any kind of hemorrhaging we might experience. So I've got a contingency plan of, okay, so if we are unable to scale up to, you know, a certain level where we need the entire space, you know, we have 58,000 square feet. Can I, you know, can I divide some of that space off to, uh, you know, to, to bring in tenants? So I do have a contingency plan that actually I had an architect draw up already um, and submit the plans to, to the city. So in the event that, you know, I have to pivot, um, you know, to cover our butts, uh, I have that ability to lease out, um, you know, space in the building and, you know, offset, you know, some of the payments. Right. So there's, um, this reminds me of, I'm not sure if you are familiar with strategic coach with Dan Sullivan. Mm. Um, so it's a, it's a, coaching program for entrepreneurs. And one of the tools he uses is, uh, it's called an impact filter. And you, you're, you're taking yourself through making a decision on something that you, you think you might want to do. And you look at the best case scenario, if you go through with it, and then you look at the worst case scenario as well. And then of course, there's work that you're, you're doing and strategies that you're doing in between in order to take the next steps to you know, get to that best case scenario. But a lot of times it just helps you really think out, okay, well, if I don't do this, here's what could happen. If I do do this, here's what can happen. But here's also what, you know, what can go wrong. And it helps you really think about if it's something that's worth doing or not. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to have to, I'm, I'm definitely going to research Dan Sullivan that yeah. because that sounds like the same sort of tactic that I, that I use, you know, writing it down, exploring worst case scenario, and then understanding if worst case scenario, if, if worst case scenario is something that I can live with. Right. Um, you know, and if you see that worst case scenario is not something that you can live with, then I would say that that is, that that risk is probably too much. Right. Exactly. So let's talk about, we were, we were talking about social media earlier. I'd love to hear, um, your thoughts on marketing, because I, I love talking marketing. Nice. <laughs> um, and with, with this product that you have, I, I'd love to hear your, you know, most successful marketing strategies and what's, you know, what's the biggest thing for you in terms of marketing? Is it word of mouth? Is it social media? Where do you put most of your efforts or are they all spread out? So just kind of your whole your um, approach to marketing for Steviva? Well, um, so we have three different divisions. We've got, you know, we've got Steviva Brands, which is our, you know, which is our retail line. And we have Steviva Ingredients, which is our ingredient line. And then we have another division, which is food science. And that's all the development of new, of new clean label, sugar reduced products and formulas. So each one of our, social media platforms is is slightly different um and when when you mentioned word of mouth um that is the most effective form of of uh i think advertising that a person can do and but i also believe that that is social media right so if you are able to you know if you're able to engage your your audience on social media and begin the conversation um, that is where the word of mouth begins. And you can only get a conversation created if you are delivering value. Right. So that's one of the things that, you know, with our social media campaigns, that's one of our primary focuses is continually uh, delivering value to, to our followers. Like if it's recipes, um, you know, where they're able to cut down their sugars or whether, you know, it's a meal plan. 
or whether it is an article on what do I do when my, you know, when my weight has plateaued or how do I, you know, how do I get myself back into ketosis when I've, you know, when I've had a high carb meal. So if we're able to, you know, if we're able to create the the value to the to the social media follower, um, then that is when word of mouth ensues. And it seems to be, and I agree with you for, for most businesses, it's word of mouth. And we have social media platforms now where people can share their stories. How do you encourage people to, to share with other consumers? Um, well, I mean, one of two ways, number one, um, we have an affiliate program. So if, if you have somebody who's like become a brand surrogate, loves your product, um, you know, we, you, we have an affiliate program that they can sign up for and then they get, you know, they get a commission on every, you know, on every transaction that sort of results from something they have posted. So that is, you know, that is one, one way that we have things, you know, get viral. Um, another, another thing that we're using in social media, uh, are contests. So on August 1st, we have a, uh, recipe contest that that's starting. And I think that the grand prize is like $5,000 or something. So that is also a way for people to, you know, generate excitement and, and conversation across social media. Love it. Contests are always a big, it's a, it's a way to bring people together as well. Love it. Well, and we're also getting the benefit of content because, you know, it's a recipe content contest. So, you know, we're, we're able to see these various recipes coming in and then we can just bring them into our R and D kitchen and actually try them out. Um, you know, and that even sparks the conversation further. Oh yeah. So you've got your audience helping you to create content. (laughs) Yep. Absolutely. (laughs) Genius. Thank you. (laughs) So now let's take a look into the future Mm. and what you see happening. You've, you know, you've been in this industry for quite a while now. What do you see happening in your industry and how do you see your, your company evolving with that? Well, I mean, I run, I run my company, you know, I think, uh, a lot in, in the way that Wayne Gretzky played hockey and he always skated to where the puck was going. Um, and that's what made him a leader in, in his field. And I, I would like to think that we, we skate, we were skating to where the puck is going. And what we're clearly saying is, um, in the media that sugar is being vilified. And we also see that there is a pandemic of, uh, obesity and diabetes, which we call diabetes. And I mean, it's just huge when you take a look at, you know, the percentages of people, um, in the United States that are overweight, it's over 75%. So over 75% of the people in the U S are classified as, is overweight. And so it's sort of the, it's sort of the perfect perfect storm for us. So, you know, we're going to continue to create lines of sweeteners and products, um, you know, that people can go to, to, you know, to reduce their sugars, help them lose weight, help them get healthier. Um, and with our food science division, we're going to be moving forward to, you know, adding, um, like plug-in solutions for food manufacturers where they can develop frostings and fillings and ice creams, you know, and a variety of different desserts that'll have like almost zero sugars and higher amounts of protein and healthy fat. So these are, this is, this is where we're going in the future. Oh, I can't wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure to get you some of everything we're doing. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Well, this has been so great. I would love to send our listeners to find out more information about Staviva, about you. Where can we send them? Um, well, you can always send them to, you know, to our, uh, to our website at Staviva. And that's S as in Sam, T-E-V-I-V-A dot com. Um, they can also go to my personal website and find out more about me. And that's TomKing.com. And that's Tom with an H-T-H-O-M-K 
K-I-N-G.com. Um, you can find both my company and me personally um, on any of the socials under T-H-O-M, K-I-N-G, or Staviva. Um, you know, I also am, encourage people just to email me directly at Tom, T-H-O-M, dot King, at Staviva.com. If you're starting a business, if you, you know, you want advice or you want to, you know, just pick my brain, um, I return every single email and I make sure that I'm, you know, completely uh, accessible. Well, that's hugely generous of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. Well, this has been fantastic. I think we've learned so much. I have. Um, I, just, I think it's an incredible history starting from the service processing business. <laughs> just, just a great, great story. And I appreciate you so much being on the show and sharing this with our listeners. Thanks, Summer. I totally appreciate it. I did this, you asked a, a really great questions and yeah, I mean, you're, you're a great interviewer. Oh, well, thank you. You're a great awesome. interviewee. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for listening to today's Get Genius. You can learn more about The Draw Shop at www.thedrawshop.com on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Your home for kick-butt custom whiteboard marketing videos. Your ideas come to life. Thanks for listening. Please share, comment, and make any suggestions for future genius guests.